So welcome everyone, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this week's Oxford Centre for Tropical Forests seminar. And our speaker today is Patrick Roberts, who is from his group leader at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History at Jena in Germany. And Patrick's work uh, looks at uh, multidisciplinary approaches to explore the past interactions of our species with forest environments across the tropics. Uh, uh, from first evolution all the way through to the development of urban societies in the late Holocene. And you'll see uh, some of that captured in, in, in today's talk. And Patrick uh, uh, studied both as an undergraduate and as a, a detail student at Oxford uh, before moving over to, to Germany and then to the Max Planck Institute. So thanks, Patrick, for uh, agreeing to come and, and, and talk to, to us. Uh, and over to you. Great, thank you so much, Yad Binder, and thank you, first of all, for the, the invitation to speak here. It's a real honor having seen all the great speakers and you've had on such diverse topics. So I'm, um, it's a real pleasure to, to come and try and contribute to the series as well. Um, yes, and also nice to be back, at least virtually uh, in Oxford. It's a shame I can't be there um, and we can't go to the pub afterwards, but I will, I will have to make do with, with virtual Q&A. Um, Great. So yes, as, as Yadvinder mentioned, what I want to try and um, sort of contribute to the seminar series, I guess, is a perspective on the deep time view of our, our species and its interaction with, with tropical forests. Um, and general stereotypes of human interactions with tropical forests will, to many of you, look a little bit like this, or at least to many members of the general public. Um, ideas of things like the Jungle Book in popular novels, and films, tropical forests tend to be the site of, of wilderness, of, of humans running with animals or perhaps not even there at all. And, and also a number of horror films have been set there um, as well. And even the word we sort of use in popular discussion, jungle comes from the sort of Hindi word jangle as uh, Jabri Ghazul wrote in, in one of his recent um, books that, that really was used in, in those contexts to mean a kind of area outside the village. Um, and so even that word that we use so um, commonly in English um, is in fact some kind of reference to this kind of them existing outside of our home comfort, if you like. Where we can't deny that humans were there in the case of sort of obviously big stone ruins, there tends to be an idea that these sort of cities somehow were lost or doomed to collapse, that this kind of extensive human population was sort of impossible in tropical forest environments. And this is still used very much in, in the media um, and in the public stereotypically, that kind of inevitably these ruins would be clawed back into the kind of dense green from where they had emerged. And there's this kind of mystery that hangs over them as well. And sort of connected to that is this kind of quite colonial idea that tropical forests are only home to very small groups and bands of people. So this is kind of Bruce Parry's Amazon, the idea that many sort of peoples in the, in, in the Amazon, for example, might be uncontacted. But I think kind of by the bored look in these children's eyes, you can tell that he is not the first person that has crossed this way uh, from, from Europe or outside their community, for example. And, and this in many ways builds upon kind of very environmentally deterministic ideas of what we think is possible in tropical forests, but also legacies of colonialism that I'll come back to a little later on. Perhaps more remarkably is that these ideas have actually sort of pervaded into archaeological and academic thought more generally. They're not just sort of in the public realm. So when we think of our species and its evolution, we think of savannas. And ever since sort of Darwin wrote about the sort of descent of man, um, the idea is that hominins have sort of left behind the forests that they'd sort of emerged and evolved into. Um, and as they did so, they became increasingly more bipedal. That freed up their hands for tool use that they were using to hunt increasingly medium and large sized game out on the savannas. And this kind of long trajectory of our species evolution out of the first hominins, out of the first origins of the genus Homo and into our species is also almost broadly connected to this kind of idea that the savanna is where our sort of homes lie. Or alternatively, when we get to sort of the origins of our species and particularly these ideas of behavioral modernity, I really don't like the term modernity in that context, but if we think about material culture, things like symbolic behaviors, complex technologies that have often been termed as this kind of idea of this origin of our species. Um, these have also often been connected to coasts where the kind of idea is that there's lots of really protein rich resources that would have allowed humans to experiment, would have allowed large dense populations to build up uh, during the Pleistocene before expanding around the world. 
And indeed, both savannas and the coast have played prominent roles when we talk about out of Africa scenarios. There's been discussions of coastal highways carrying people all the way from Africa to Australia and into North America during the late Pleistocene. Or alternatively, there's been discussions of the fact that humans could only supposedly move through Southeast Asia when rainforests retreated and grasslands expanded during drier periods. And so these hold not just for sort of broad evolutionary narratives, but also in discussions about how our species went on to colonize the different continents. Moving a bit later in time, these stereotypes have also often shaped how we've thought about the origins of agriculture, the origins of food production um, in the archaeological record as well. Um, you might be familiar with this kind of human ecology discussion from the 1980s, where Bailey et al. argued that it is impossible to live in a rainforest um, without access to um, cultivated resources elsewhere. And sort of alongside that, cultivation itself has been seen as very difficult on poor soils, uh, high hydrologically active environments as well. And this kind of the yam question you might have heard in Africa, whether yams are sort of enough carbohydrate to support a population in a rainforest there alone. And sort of alongside that has been the idea that there aren't really any big game opportunities. There aren't really animals that could be domesticated uh, in tropical forests either. And this means that discussions of agricultural origins have focused on what we think agriculture should be. And so as a result, we've looked at the Middle East as the origins of agriculture, sort of the classic ideas of barley, wheat, cattle, sheep, goat, and pigs that then went to expand through Europe. Um, there's been a tension on, on China, the river valleys of China in terms of rice, agriculture. And in the context of maize in the Americas, a lot of focus has been on the drier upland valley regions um, and things like that. But throughout this, there's been a sort of idea that, that we need sweeping fields to discuss about agriculture. Um, and that's sort of the origins we've been looking for in the archaeological record as well. And as a consequence, tropical forests have really been quite left behind in these discussions. It's also the case that sort of the multi-phase, when we think of archaeology, you might have sort of seen recently the dig on Netflix, uh, but the idea that, that archaeology is done by sort of multi-annual uh, excavations at one given site. As you can imagine, this is a picture taken by my colleague Vida Cosmatono in Kalimantan. This journey being your route to the site every single day is obviously going to prohibit the kind of excavations that have been done in areas like the Middle East or um, Europe that are sort of so in a way, also finding the sites, getting to the sites, surveying the sites has been difficult on top of these challenges. And so this has left, obviously, perhaps archaeologists looking elsewhere. This is kind of not easy terrain to go out and find a site sort of stereotypically. Also, when we're thinking about larger sites in terms of urban settlements, there's often also natural hazards that, that are kind of thought about. The idea of flooding and mudslides. This is an example from Vargas in Venezuela from 1999 when 10,000, 15,000 people were killed in a single flooding event. Um, and on top of that, again, returning back, if we can't have agriculture uh, in tropical forests, then we can't really have dense urban settlements because that's what we assume that these kind of cities must be based on, based on our own ideas of what cities are as well. And then to add even more on top of that, the kind of soils themselves often are poor in terms of preservation. We might find things like stone tools, but in terms of the organic uh, remains that we use to date sites, um, and in terms of things like um, preserved plant remains, preserved animal remains that let us know exactly what humans were doing um, at these sites, this has also been a downside and why people have also perhaps avoided tropical forests in terms of archaeological research as well. And this gets us back to the kind of stereotypical idea that this is kind of the classic tropical forest, the perception there that it's a sort of intact area, there are no people living in it, and that's sort of always been the case. And in turn, this has sort of implications for then how we see um, conservation initiatives in the tropics, um, but also discussions, broader discussions um, of the Anthropocene. And this is important because as Yadvinda um, and colleagues wrote in a recent paper, tropical forests are crucial to concepts of the Anthropocene and Earth systems because even local and regional impacts on these environments can build up to have Earth systems feedbacks that are on a much wider scale. So for example, they're the third biggest source of carbon emissions, a bigger source than the European Union, they host an unprecedented amount of um, biodiversity, and so therefore any extinctions in these environments will have global ramifications. And they're also responsible for a significant amount of land-based rainfall, which again means if deforestation occurs, it can alter climates on local and regional scales as well. But because in an archaeological standpoint, there's not been that much good evidence for humans being there, 
looking for the roots of the Anthropocene, we've sent, tend to be forced to stop at sort of the industrial period when sort of commercialized logging occurs, um, when mechanization occurs. Um, and it's uh, perhaps in contrast to other environments where the discussion has been a little broader, although this is beginning to change and, and, and Yadvinder and colleagues also mentioned the earlier evidence that I'm gonna come on to a bit later. But in general, our ideas of the Anthropocene in these environments have been that sort of this is a post-industrial thing, that human impacts on tropical forests and hence earth systems ha do not have a really long-term precedent. And that means that when we're looking at solutions or conservation ideas, we're only looking to the industrial period and perhaps not before when we're thinking about how humans might have changed forest structure, um, species um, diversity, or perhaps even where forests grow at all. And so what I'm gonna, this talk is split into a couple of different sections. Um, the first is kind of going from this kind of idea of tropical forests as green deserts, looking at the deep time human evidence um, in tropical forests, both for kind of the origins of our species, then the emergence of food production, and then evidence for urbanism as well. Before moving then on to discussions of what this might mean for discussions of the Anthropocene and finding the roots of the Anthropocene in these environments, and then finishing on what practical information or what use is this record, this archeological record for working in tropical forests today to try and come up with policies, solutions and discussions with stakeholders. So to start off with then, I mentioned that a lot of archeological research looking at late Pleistocene human origins and dispersals has been focused on savannas, has been focused on coastal settings. But when myself and Mike Petraglia reviewed the sites um, that existed in sort of within tropical forest areas in 2015, we actually came up with a significant amount of sites. And in the cases of South Asia and Southeast Asia, a lot of these sites are actually the earliest evidence of humans in a given area. And they're found in areas where there is tropical forest there today, be that tropical rainforest or, and by tropical forest, I should say I'm defining all forests within the tropics. I guess that's a crucial thing that I should say to begin with. Um, and that will become even more relevant later on. And so perhaps while public stereotypes are commonly thinking of rainforests in general, there's obviously a huge raft of diversity that you see every day, every week in your seminar series that says tropical forests are far more than just that. And that has implications for also doing research there. Um, but anyway, moving to Africa, first of all, um, you might have seen this very recent paper that was highlighting that unlike kind of common ideas that we have of the humans emerged in one single population at one moment in time in Africa and then expanded everywhere, that actually the origin of our species in Africa has lots of fragmented roots, that actually variation within our species, whether it's in the fossil record, whether it's in our genes, actually occurs from a result of interrelationships between different populations across Africa. And what this means is that we can no longer look at South Africa or East Africa as the origins of our species, either in a savanna setting or on the coast, but actually it's the whole of Africa that led to what eventually was to merge as our species that then emerged out of Africa and to which we sort of share all our ancestry with um, wherever we are around the globe today. And this work this uh, work also by um, Dr. Eleanor Sherry, she's doing working on West and Af East, uh, Central African sites in Africa to look at how West and Central Africa were part of this sort of Pan-African network. And within this, this obviously means that contrary to sort of traditional ideas that the tropical forests of Africa themselves therefore maybe have quite an important role to play and part of this. And this is the kind of classic Lupemban uh, stone tools, these kind of beautiful uh, sort of um, pear shaped um, axes that have been identified in Central and West Africa for a long period of time. There's debate as to whether this actually constitutes a sort of single cultural entity, um, but it's very clear that, that these stone tools exist in various sites, as you can see in the map here. Um, and they appear to be found there where marine records show that there was tropical forest covering somewhere in Africa. Um, but one of the problems is that these are often poorly dated. This is a real case where many of the open air sites in Central and West Africa are reworked, or there's been high levels of water activity making these stone tools very hard to date first of all. And so there are dates ranging all the way from 200,000 years ago, which would place them right back at the origins of our species, all the way through to sort of 30,000 years ago. And it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly in many sites, um, which kind of area of that date range these stone tools are coming from. There's also the problem that they're not preserved with any organic remains. So we can't really see what plants these might have been used for. It's been proposed they were used as digging sticks to try and extract tubers or yams from forest settings. It's also been proposed they were used as spears to catch rainforest prey. 
Um, but again, we have no direct evidence that this is the case. And finally, as you all know, just because a site is in a tropical forest today does not mean it was in the past. Um, and so actually, although we have a Marine Corps that says, well, there was forest, tropical rainforest even, in some parts of Central and West Africa, that doesn't mean it was there, it was exactly where these stone tools were. Um, and so at present, this remains a sort of indicator. I'm pretty confident that eventually it will be found that there are very early examples of our species living in rainforests and other tropical forests in these parts of Africa, but at present, this remains um, quite hotly debated. A site we did work on in East Africa is this site of Pangia Saidi on the East African coast. Um, what we can see here is that it's pretty close to the coast and it would have been close to the coast in the past as well. It's within about 20 kilometers. And even during the late Pleistocene, it would probably have been a maximum of about 25 kilometers further away. And yet, despite these sort of models of Indian Ocean expansion coastal highways, we find no evidence for coastal resource use actually um, at this site. In fact, the only part of coastal evidence we see is actually in some of these beads, these kind of symbolic um, beads seem to be coming from coastal materials, but the resources themselves, there's no evidence at the site for humans using marine resources. Instead, what we have is them using a combination of tropical forests and more open grassland settings, all the way from 78,000 years ago, right through to 3,000 years ago. And this is continuing even as agriculture is arriving uh, in the area as well. And so it seems that this mixture of tropical forest prey, hunting things like monkeys and through to bush pigs, um, out into more open um, prey as well, really sustained communities in this part of the world. And so we have evidence for at least the use of tropical forests here, albeit in something of a mosaic environment. And this is something that's been observed elsewhere in Southern and Eastern Africa along the sort of rainforest fringes where you sort of get more of a gradient into tropical forests, into wood, drier woodlands and grasslands. That these appear to be important corridors for human movement during the late Pleistocene. Now, where my work started in, in, as a PhD student as well was actually in Sri Lanka. This is the island off the um, sort of uh, southern tip of India. And Sri Lanka was fascinating because here we had the sort of first four, the earliest four sites with human remains, not just human remains in earliest human remains in Sri Lanka, but also the entirety of South Asia at the time, dating to around about 38,000, although we now know that's 45,000 years ago with newer dating techniques all sit in the southwestern wet zone of Sri Lanka in a rain, what is today a rainforest environment. And so this went quite against sort of prevailing views at the time, particularly when the Sri Lankan archeologist, Sirandarini Agala, first presented them to the sort of European world in the 1980s. And he not only showed that these human remains were there, he showed that these microlithic toolkits, um, which are these tiny little stone tools that you might've seen in the news and are often related to bow and arrow technology, he presented these and he said, look, we have these in Sri Lanka um, as early as 38,000 years ago, or at the time 28,000 because of the, the dating methods he was using. And then the Europe, that would have placed them earlier than their appearance in Europe at the time. And European archeologists said, or, you know, in, in true colonial style said, oh, that can't be right. Um, but actually as the work has gone on, he has been completely and fully uh, vindicated. Um, and we now definitely know that these sites were in rainforests in the past. And not only that, but as I say, with renewed dating efforts, we can now see that they date back 45,000 years ago. And we don't just have these small stone tools. We also have bone points um, that have been hailed as sort of the earliest evidence for bow and arrow technology anywhere outside of Africa now. Um, and, and they're made on monkey bones, monkeys that we know live in the canopy of these rainforests. Um, and they were actually hunting these monkeys to then build bone tools out of these monkeys to then hunt more monkeys. Um, and there's really quite a beautiful specialized um, kind of hunting strategy there um, and, and sort of hinting at, you know, up to 70% of these, of the animals found in these sites are monkeys, um, which is not really heard of anywhere else in the world, but does show that they were developing uh, quite a stable subsistence strategy um, in the Sri Lankan rainforest at this time. But as you can sort of see from this map, people, again, we could have the same argument as, as potentially still going on in Africa. Okay, they're in rainforest today. Were they in rainforest in the past? Or even if these sites were in rainforest in the, in, in the past, look at how close it is to get to another environment. So maybe actually humans were just sort of using rainforest for a bit, and then they moved out and used the coast or grassland settings. And so my PhD involved applying stable isotope analysis to some of the human teeth um, found at the site. Because what we can do with this is using carbon isotope analysis, um, which you may or may not be, be familiar with depending on, on your background, um, but we can actually use carbon isotope analysis or the discrimination between heavier carbon uh, 13 and lighter carbon 12 um, 
the ratio of these isotopes varies in plants depending on photosynthesis and, and primarily between sort of plants following the C3 pathway or the C4 pathway. And that might sound like a lot of jargon, but actually all that refers to is the number of carbons found in the first sugar um, made by photosynthesis. Um, and in the C3 corner, we have things like wheat, we have rice, and in the C4 corner, we have things like maize and millet. So it's very useful when we want to look at perhaps the arrival of agriculture, for example. But in the tropics, it also tends to have a sort of ecological patterning in wild plants. So C3 plants tend to dominate in tropical rainforest environments, tropical forest environments. C4 plants tend to dominate in more open grassland settings. And there's an even greater influence within sort of C3 plants in a forest. You have lower delta 13C or lower ratios of the heavier to the um, lighter isotope under dense canopies due to a recycling of carbon dioxide and lower light than you do in more open forest settings as well. And so we can use this to look at where animals and also humans were living and what kind of resources they were eating uh, over the long term, over the entire period their teeth were forming. And so here is a plot and, and just to sort of orientate you, you have carbon isotopes on the bottom, the lower it is is towards the left and the higher it is, is towards the right. And you can see that when we look at the animals in Sri Lanka, the green, the dense rainforest animals are all over on the lower side. Animals living in a drier, more intermediate rainforest are in this kind of orange uh, ellipse there in the middle. And then these animals far living in grasslands, things like elephants, hare, um, they're up on the C4 side of things. They're, they're the highest um, along on the right-hand side. So we can use this to sort of plot where the humans sit um, in the past. And so this is the first human, the earliest human at the time when, when we were doing the sampling was 36,000 years ago. This date has changed probably about 38,000 years ago now. Um, and you can see that the animals associated with this human um, actually spread across the three ellipses. So actually showing that environments were actually quite variable um, at the time, but the human itself was relying mostly on rainforest resources. Ooh. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, this continued into the last glacial maximum. You can see that the humans shift over. Um, this is because forests are opening most likely in the last glacial maximum due to drier conditions in Sri Lanka. But this might look that they're moving towards the savannah, but they're not. They're still staying within the forest realm. And we know this because in Africa, there's, a, there's an assumption, or there was always an assumption that hominins or humans would head for the savannah, head for the grassland as soon as they could, right? So in the traditional model, we would expect humans to be over at minus six, minus five, because why not go and hunt the big, medium, large game in the grasslands when they're available? But no, even in the most driest portion, when the tropical forests are at their sort of um, smallest extent, they're still staying within, albeit drier forests. This continues into the early Holocene and the terminal Pleistocene. And the sort of exception that proves the rule really um, is that even as we get into the middle to late Holocene, the only two humans that get into this C4 side are associated with the Iron Age, which is when humans move, when populations moved into this part of the island with iron technology and with millet agriculture. And millet is in fact a C4 crop. <clears throat> and so we can see that actually there's a really sustainable specialized adaptation to tropical rainforest environments in Sri Lanka from the earliest arrival of humans through to this period. And even then, even when agriculture is arriving, there are still humans using the forest resources. And this is a pattern seen elsewhere out of Africa, um, not just in Sri Lanka. In Southeast Asia, you might have heard of the near caves in Borneo. This is one of the classic kind of examples of early tropical rainforest adaptations by humans. At this site, there's evidence for humans manipulating toxic plants. Um, to survive, to use carbohydrates, processing them in different ways. There's evidence for them hunting wild boar, um, as well as things like gibbons and even orangutans. Um, and it's really taken an example where humans were clearly utilizing tropical rainforest resources. And even perhaps there's even arguments that they were burning the, the surrounding forest to maintain patches of kind of swamp forest, um, lowland rain, uh, rainforest, as well as some more open grassland patches as well, which would have promoted the migrating boar as well. We even see this up in the highlands of New Guinea in forests that can actually even get snow and frost in winter and, and certainly would have through the last glacial maximum as well. We see humans with these kind of hand axe, uh, not hands, well, uh, pebble stone tool technologies, as well as pandanus nuts. Um, they were using starchy tree um, crops as well while they were up there, all the way from 45,000 years ago um, as well. As soon as humans are getting into this part of the world, they're up there. 
and less discussed perhaps recently in terms of at least the tropical portion, but you might have caught the sort of La Lindosa rock art that made quite a quite a splash in the media um, uh, in Colombia. And, and we can see here that, that humans were in the Colombian Amazon by about 12,000, 13,000 years ago, and they were already had some kind of cultural relationship with different types of megafauna. <clears throat> which exact megafauna or which exact animals remains hotly debated, but there is ongoing projects to look at what humans were doing uh, as they reached the sort of Amazon basin, but we certainly know they were there from about 14,000 years ago. They were also in the Highland Andes, the forests of the Highland Andes by 12,000 years ago, and sort of populations of the region today have genetic signatures that show an adaptation to high altitude settings. Um, that, that is a sort of follow on from that, that early adaptation of these difficult um, areas. And so trop tropical forests are obviously not the only story in, in human origins. They are part of, but what I would say is they're part of an emerging evidence that our species did not do things the easy way. It didn't just stay in savannas and it didn't just stay along coasts. We now have evidence of humans in high altitude areas in Lesotho in Africa as early as 80,000 years ago, uh, in Highland Ethiopia around about the same time, on the Tibetan plateau by at least 45,000 years ago dealing with high altitude, uh, often very different resources, um, and, and even staying there through periods of cold temperature. We have evidence for humans in deserts uh, as early as 70,000 years ago, sometimes in periods when these deserts were wetter, but also sometimes in periods when these deserts were drying, humans were still there. Um, and we also have evidence for humans making it up into the sort of Arctic circle by 45,000 years ago as well. And so myself and a colleague highlighted this as kind of an example of, you know, the idea that, that our species is not characterized by this long trajectory towards savannas, but is rather what makes our species unique is actually its ability to inhabit all of these very different environments. And we argued that there was a kind of different in, in terms of, you know, you have specialist animals that focus, their whole population focuses on one kind of thing, like a panda, for example, focused on bamboo. You have generalist animals such as, um, you know, raccoons, that individuals can do lots of different things, um, but they're sort of as a whole a generalist. And often we've been called generalists, right? Humans have been seen as the ultimate generalist because we can kind of do everything. But we argued that there was perhaps something slightly different going on because what we seem to see in the late Pleistocene is not just that our species can do everything, but actually populations of our species can go and specialize in doing something, right? And in Sri Lanka, we could even see that while this population is in the rainforest, clearly relying all year round on the rainforest, it's communicating with a group on the coast. There are shark teeth, there are marine shell beads arriving in these rainforest sites, even as these humans are relying on all of their economic sort of subsistence on the rainforest themselves. So that suggests that there are these trade networks already existing. And the advantages are obvious. If you have populations living in these very different environments, including extreme environments, if you get broader global challenges, a climate change, for example, or even regional changes, you not only have fallback networks between these populations, but if one human population is extirpated, as we know happens in the Middle East, right? We humans get out of the Middle East around about 200,000 years ago, but then that population disappears again until 45,000 years ago. And it's argued that that population was sort of extirpated by climate change. But what's very clear is as that happened, that clearly probably happened all over the world, but we were continued as a species to overall grow. And we argue that kind of part of this is the fact that populations could not only use lots of different environments, but actually they could also begin to sort of specialize in them as well. But this is all to kind of say really that tropical forests are clearly a key part of our origins. They're not the only part, but they're part of it, this kind of broader discussion of how we're unique in our ability to deal with variability, um, something that's come to be known as, as kind of an ecological plasticity. And not only inhabiting tropical forests, but even this early on, there's also evidence that we were, we were manipulating them. I mentioned the kind of um, example from the near caves, um, but this is also in, in different areas as well. There's evidence for burning to maintain open patches to perhaps promote prey. Um, there's evidence, for example, um, that, uh, that um, in the, the hunting of megafauna, for example, in areas in, in the Amazon would have changed environmental dynamics as well. And one of my favorite examples is in sort of near Oceania, there's evidence that from 20,000 years ago, um, humans were moving around these little critters, these, these couscous uh, as food sources. As they moved to a new tropical island, they brought them with them because they acknowledged that protein wasn't necessarily the easiest to come by. And they took them with them and these populations have exploded. Um, and they're still there today providing um, reliable protein sources for human societies. And so even this early on, 
even before we're getting into discussions of cultivation and food production, we have humans potentially also already taking a hand in sort of shaping tropical forest environments to how they would like them. Moving to sort of actual evidence of, of domestication, we often, again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a stereotype that these environments aren't suited to kind of the agriculture that we think of um, in our sort of Euro-American societies. But we forget that things like, as I'll sort of try and show, many of the things that we take for granted in our cupboards come from tropical forests. They were domesticated in tropical forests. And from a kind of focus on the Middle East, Europe, and, and sort of East Asia, we now know that these sort of areas pointed on this map, all are areas where food production developed in the tropics, sometimes in, in relationship with forests as well. And the important thing here, which is something I mentioned at the start, is that when we're talking, you know, an archaeological stereotype is that, again, like I mentioned, tropical forest equals tropical rainforest, but it obviously doesn't. Um, and actually what's becoming increasingly clear is that where this early cultivation is happening, they tend to be in transects like montane areas where you have montane rainforests of different types grading into more lowland rainforest into perhaps more open settings or where you have dry forests live, um, growing alongside on boundaries between wet evergreen rainforests and more dry deciduous forests as well. And as archeologists have started to look in these regions, we're seeing just how important these kind of environments were to some of these early cultivation experiments. So one of the earliest examples of this was a Cook Swamp in the New Guinea Highlands. Here it was sort of, um, you can kind of see this on, on the right hand side, these kind of patterns, these are plotted uh, features by archaeologists. And it was argued in the 1970s, as early as that, I think, by Jack Golson, that these represented humans digging drainage ditches for cultivation, and that perhaps they even represented settlements. Um, as early as 10,000 years ago, so this is kind of the argument for an agricultural village as early as 10,000 years ago. And within these soils, although we one of the downsides in studying sort of the origins of agriculture in the tropics is that you don't get the nice charred seeds or the nice animal bones often that you can get in, in other settings, more arid zones where they preserve. So we're relying on things like phytoliths, things like pollen, things like starch preserved um, to try and identify some of these things, which is often a disadvantage. Um, but in this case, it was found that bananas, taro, and even the ancestors of sugarcane were found in these features, these development of phases through time. And what was interesting is that, although from phytoliths you can't really look necessarily at domestication, what was interesting is that these plants were being moved into areas they wouldn't naturally grow, right? Bananas very naturally grow in a very different environment to sugarcane and taro. And so the fact that they're all found together was seen as an ex a sort of argument for why humans are bringing these together alongside these draining ditches. The early evidence around about 10,000 years ago remains still a little debated, but certainly this kind of phase two 7,000 years ago is, is pretty now solidly accepted that by this time, humans are draining the landscape so that they can grow taro, they can grow patches of banana, and they can grow even things like sugarcane in the same kind of area. So they're manipulating their food sources that came from this natural altitudinal transect, but they're bringing them together into one place so that they can sort of harness the food in that way. The wider landscape also shows evidence for increased burning around about 10,000 years ago, conveniently around about the time where you are getting these crops coming together, perhaps in areas where you have, you're opening up parts of the forest to get grasslands. <coughs> um, and so Simon Haberley's done a lot of work, not just in the vicinity of Cook Swamp, but also elsewhere in the highlands, showing that there is a potential signature of humans increasingly manipulating the landscape at this time. Um, and it's not just necessarily plants that, that have an early cultivation history in the tropics as well. We Things like um, water buffalo, swamp and river water buffalo, actually remarkably are the animal relied upon most by um, populations around the world today. Not in terms of their number, but in terms of products and subsistence economy due to their heavy use across Asia. And it looks like, you know, that these are two sort of different subspecies, but they look to have both in both cases been domesticated in areas that were likely very wet. Uh, within the tropics, either in Southeast Asia as well as South Asia, respectively, um, either in areas where you have swamps and swamp forests, or in areas where you have a sort of river basin um, with, with sort of drier forests in the area. Chickens, though, are the most obvious example. We perhaps don't think of this enough, but they are a tropical forest domestica. They're domesticated from the jungle fowl, which is adapted to living in rainforests. Um, recent genetic studies have shown that all of our chickens actually come from a domestication event in Southeast Asia from a jungle fowl which following after that, different chicken populations have then integrated with other jungle fowl populations, including interestingly in Sri Lanka, um, to leave us with the chickens that we have today and are some of the most numerous animals across the face of the planet. But they are actually 
tropical forest domesticus. They come originally from tropical forests. So again, although we have this stereotype that, that cultivation and agriculture is not really fitting, some of the major things that we rely on come from that. This is also the case with maize. I mentioned that a lot of discussions of the origins of maize have been linked to uh, kind of high altitude dry settings where you have nice charred maize cobs. You can really see the progress from domestication. But actually recent work looking at phytoliths and also the genetics of maize have suggested that actually it's far more likely and, and it looks certainly that it was domesticated in the tropical river valleys uh, of the Balsas River Valley. Um, and so even here, we often think of maize, if you've seen the film Interstellar, maize is seen as like the ideal crop to adapting to an arid environment. But again, it actually comes from um, most likely a tropical humid area where its ancestor Tia Sinte grows. Um, and so as we're doing different methods, more multidisciplinary approaches, we can again see the importance of tropics in what is, this crop is one of the key across the planet today. And again, we probably have the tropics to thank for it um, once again. Rice is another interesting example, which it's not, it's not being originally domesticated in the tropics, but certainly it's expanding into the tropics as early as the middle to late Holocene. This is the classic example of, of the kind of Banaui, Banaui uh, rice terraces in the Philippines. Um, but it's often been linked to kind of rampant deforestation that you do have human populations, not just cultivating things in the, within the tropics developed in tropical forests, but also you have crops coming from outside tropical forests very early on. Um, so rice is one example. It's been associated with significant deforestation and burning uh, in Southeast Asia as it expanded. <coughs> Although there's increasing debate, it seems interestingly that the dry forest burnt were, it led to a lot of burning, whereas rainforests seem to have sort of slowed its spread. Um, and it's more seen in coastal delta areas, particularly as well, whereas you're getting wet rice agriculture. That makes sense. There's also evidence for the independent domestication of rice within India um, in river valleys, wet tropical river valleys as well. Um, and so again, we can see that even sort of early humans expanding with agriculture into tropical forests are leading to changes, are inhabiting tropical landscapes um, pretty early on. In the Caribbean, we can also see this as well, the colonization of the Caribbean from sort of 8,000 years ago in Trinidad, which is just off the coast of South America, um, through to later period, sort of what's called the ceramic um, expansion later on around about 5,000, 4,000 uh, years ago. These populations are moving again, things from the Americas. They're moving manioc from the Amazon basin. Uh, they're moving in maize with them later on. They're moving in chili peppers. They're moving in guinea pigs. They're moving in dogs. And so you have humans bringing invasive species, managing tropical forest landscapes in the Caribbean. Um, again, really early on. This is, this is kind of changes to tropical forest landscapes, the introduction of food production and cultivation um, quite early on with potential ramifications to um, the existing species, the existing environments. Um, there's also various evidence in the Caribbean for this potentially leading to megafaunal extinctions or extinctions of other taxa, um, as well as placing pressure on marine resources as well to varying extents. So humans are having leaving a large footprint in these areas as they're expanding into them. It's also debated in the, the Western Central Africa, the expansion of Bantu speaking populations it's often been argued that this was only possible again as the rainforest detracted because the, the idea is again, they're bringing millet uh, with them. Millet is seen as an arid adapted crop that couldn't possibly grow in the rainforest, which means that these populations could only expand when the rainforest either retreated as a result of climate or whether humans cut them down. And so um, it's been argued that as millet is found further and further south, that this is associated with a deforestation signal with some even arguing that sort of marine sediment cores or cores in river deltas show widespread soil erosion linked to this agricultural expansion. But interestingly, when we look at sites on the ground, what we actually see is there's not just one big expansion that occurs when the rainforest was sort of retreating around about this time. There's lots of different expansions, different points in time, up different river deltas within the Congo basin more widely. And on top of that, millet is found alongside things like oil palm, alongside things like cowpea that are being integrated into more diverse agroforestry strategies that need not necessitate uh, removal of forest. And even one of our colleagues in the University of Cologne, uh, Hans-Peter Wotzke, he's even done experiments showing that you even can grow millet in a rainforest, right? So showing that actually on the ground, even people moving into forests don't necessarily lead to, agriculture does not have to lead to deforestation, even when it's something moving from outside of these tropical forest environments, even when it's something we associate with kind of field sweeping fields, that actually even populations moving into tropical forests with new novel domesticates 
could actually adapt them to local scenarios into more agroforestry kind of situations as well. And so overall, just sort of feeding back in again to this kind of idea of, of humans, not only, not only is there evidence for food production, and, I, and I've just skimmed the surface there, there's lots of evidence in the Amazon as well that I didn't really touch upon. Not only are humans practicing food production in, in tropical forests around the world, not only are they domesticating tropical forest plants and animals, not only are they also bringing in different things from outside the tropics to cultivate in these settings, but they're also potentially manipulating these forests very early on, having big impacts potentially, whether it's through deforestation, um, whether it's through changes to the soils. And what we see is, this was uh, argued by Ruderman for this kind of early Anthropocene hypothesis. He argued that without agriculture, you, we would have actually returned to a cooling, that, that, that there's this kind of greenhouse effect that's linked, interestingly by him, he links it to methane um, expansion with, with rice farming, wet rice farming, um, and also water buffalo expansions, which links us to the tropics. <clears throat> as well as the expansion of cattle in different areas, so not just the tropics. But there's an argument, an increasing argument to be made that the more that we find these early food producing um, societies in the tropics, the more important it is to look at tropical forests from this early stage as potential contributors to, if we're going to have an early Anthropocene hypothesis, then it's not just happening uh, in, in sort of non-tropical areas, in more in areas where we think agriculture should expand, but it could be happening um, in areas that where, we, where there's tropical forest as well. Although, as I mentioned, I'm a bit cautious about that because I think that actually a lot of these adaptations show combination with agroforestry, show a, a sort of that actually, in fact, our understanding of what agriculture is needs to change when we look at the tropics. And so finally, in this kind of sort of tour of, of sort of forests and what they have to offer archaeologically um, is this idea of lost cities, the idea that sort of all we find is ruins and that tropical forests could not support pre-industrial urban populations. Well, these are the areas around the world where we now know that there were urban populations. Um, we've known that for a while, but they've tended to be written off as sort of inevitably going into decline um, because how could a big city exist based on sort of extensive agriculture in the tropics? And here, what's been really crucial to sort of overturning these ideas is the technology of LIDAR, which involves kind of blasting a load of laser rays from an aerial position. I'm sure you'll have seen it in kind of more ecological discussions of looking at forest composition. But as archaeologists, we're interested in the lasers that pass through the canopy and bounce back up off the floor. And we have to bombard the, bombard the, the sort of canopy multiple times to make sure that enough pass through to then show us what's actually preserved underneath. So this is an example from the Greater Angkor area. And kind of if you went there today as a tourist, you'd see these big temples and you'd say, wow, OK, there's these monumental temples there. But they were surely symbolic sites within kind of, you know, they were of symbolic significance. There weren't people living in these forest landscapes and look, the forest has sprung up around them to really claim them back. Well, this is what happened when Damien Evans flew over them with a LIDAR um, survey. And what you can actually see is that this is not just a temple. In and around that temple, you have domestic dwellings of thousands and thousands of people supporting that temple infrastructure. This is a vast urban landscape. Um, and the more that we've used LIDAR, the more there's been surveyed, the more it's clear that you don't just have monumental stone areas, but you actually have areas that have been occupied across vast um, scenarios, the greatest, in fact, pre-industrial cities in the world. So this is Greater Angkor after being mapped, not only by um, LIDAR, which Damien Evans did in, from Paris, but also Christophe Poitier surveying the area on foot, going through forests and surveying different remains. And this sort of greater Angkor thrived from kind of the, it began in the 8th century AD um, in Cambodia before, and it lasted till about the 14th century AD. And by the 14th century AD, it was the largest pre-industrial city ever seen. This is a thousand kilometers squared of urban landscape on top of 3000 kilometers squared of managed landscape supporting that. Um, and humans were supporting themselves. They, they were planting rice, but they were also using rivers for fish. They were using maintained forest orchards for vegetables, for fruits. And they were using this vast aqueduct network that turned this kind of area, this area that is prone to seasonal variation again, and it can be quite dry. It's a real dry seasonal forest that, that usually grows here. But actually this vast water network allowed them to survive there through even the driest conditions. And there's even evidence that they were applying a clay sand on the bottom of this to make sure that water could keep flowing properly. <coughs> And so this network, this kind of artificially reconstructed river basin, if you like, was sustaining one of the biggest cities around the world, it's bigger than Rome, 
bigger than um, London, right? There really is a pre-industrial, not London today, but pre-industrial uh, cities. This, this really was the biggest that we have evidence for at the present time. And while it may have eventually failed, from the 8th century AD to the 14th century AD, that's 600 years. That's longer than almost all industrial cities in the tropics. The classic Maya, surely, you know, this is an example that we commonly associate with failure, right? That you have, again, these stone temples for elites, um, kings that were ruling in these areas that were relying on kind of human sacrifice, warfare, um, things like that, that are, again, they've, they've collapsed, right? We, we know from books by Jared Diamond that this is one of the classic examples of where humans overstretched. They tried to live in an environment where really this shouldn't be going on. But again, when we've used LIDAR, when we've used mapping, we see that these stone centers are just the tip of the iceberg. And actually around cities like, in this case, Caracol, you again have artificially manipulated landscapes. You have terracing, you have um, sort of constructed waterways that are really seeing humans. It's not a compact city as we think of a city. It's a dispersed city, something that's called a sort of low density agrarian city um, that, that goes with Greater Angkor was one example where you have not just sort of administration kind of cities as we think of them today, dense housing, but you actually have fields, you have aqueducts, you have forests in these cities. You really have a green agrarian city. So food production is not coming from a sort of um, area elsewhere. It's happening within the city. And we also have this with the Maya. A sort of shows the idea that we think of when we look at the classic Maya, this idea that maize fields has grown in America today cut everything down and this is what you have. B is actually more what the evidence now shows. You have some patches of maize grown in milpa farms that were actually a form of Sweden where you would have sort of a, pl a plot of maize that would then move. Um, you have use of again, orchards, wild forests. You even had use of wild deer, the fattening of wild deer even. Um, you really had quite diverse landscapes that are actually surviving um, and even beyond collapse, right? We think that the Maya collapsed, but actually they didn't, they still live there. Milpa agriculture is still taking place today by indigenous Maya populations. Not only that, but even after the collapse, populations moved up into the Terminal Classic period. They moved to the highlands, they moved to rivers, they moved to areas where there was reliable water. Yes, they abandoned areas where it was drier, but they kept there. This, this food strategy, this strategy lasted for thousands of years and is still there today. Even in Sri Lanka, if you've been to Sri Lanka, you'll sort of know the Golden Triangle uh, example um, of Anuradhapura. This is just another example. Again, it's not just the temples where you have this, but you actually have um, evidence for a really big population, a population, a, a, a sort of urban extent that's bigger than modern day Liverpool, actually. Um, each of these rice vats could have fed a thousand people rice uh, a given sitting. And if you go there, you will see many, many, many of these. Um, and so again, in these northern tropical forests in Sri Lanka, you have a similar pattern of large scale agrarian urbanism. Even in the Amazon basin, so long thought to not have dense human populations, right, associated with small scale populations. We now have evidence that humans are modifying soils. Um, I saw you're going to be having a talk by Tostiga um, later on, who's really shown that trees um, have been shaped by where humans have lived in the past of the Amazon. You have these Amazonian dark earths across this vast area now, earthworks, forest islands, um, and actually estimates towards the population of the Amazon now are thought to be potentially as high as 20 million. Um, living in things like these garden cities, these garden city networks, again, it's not quite the same as what we've seen before, but it's a similar principle. You have different nodes connected with forests staying standard, standing. You have Sweden agriculture, you have a heavy use of rivers, even the corralling of things like um, freshwater turtles, tortoises, and um, fish as well. You have this mixed um, sort of subsistence strategy supporting what is in effect an urban network. Um, and this is not just seen, this is seen in the Zingu River Basin. This is where this kind of garden cities idea comes from, the work of Mike Heckenberger, but it's also been found in other areas. And there's obviously, we don't really know the footprint that these cities have left, but it's very clear that they were around for centuries. Um, and in the case of Anuradhapura, actually that city, Anuradhapura was around for nearly 2000 years, right? That is a long time for a city. It didn't just fail. Um, and so inevitably these cities must have had a big impact on tropical forests. And there's debates again in the Amazon, did, did, uh, how, to what extent is Amazon species distribution shaped by these 
sort of um, pre-colonial human populations. How much deforestation did they did they produce? There's arguments that in uh, the region of the classic Maya lowlands, deforestation was enough to lead to climate change, was enough to lead to a drying of the landscape that eventually contributed to them having to um, abandon parts of the landscape. It's clear that they must have had an impact and we probably need to take this into account when we're thinking about the regions today, but we just don't know yet. So this is an area I think of expanding future research. <clears throat> and so I, I realize I'm, I'm running a little out of time, but that's kind of um, sort of setting up the evidence of kind of the long, what, what I think is increasingly growing is the deep time record of humans in tropical forests. But the question is then, well, where did it go? Why do we think of tropical forests today as not having anyone in them? Why do we think them as not supporting agriculture and not supporting cities? Well, the answer is in fact, probably Europeans. Um, and so from around about the 1400s, 1500s, obviously, you have these European empires expanding into the tropics. This is an example of the Spanish empire, um, sort of around about 1580 it was a pantropical empire. It was one of the first pantropical empires. It, it was in the tropics from uh, the Americas through to Africa, through to Southeast Asia. And when it combined with Portugal, it was also in South Asia. This is an evidence where you have, you now have links between all of these tropical continents. Um, and this inevitably led to changes. And one of them, and tragically is of course, the spread of European diseases, smallpox, measles, bubonic plague, influenza, and typhoid. It's now estimated that those diseases brought by Europeans led to a 90% reduction of the population that lived in the neotropics before the time of contact. That is incredible in terms of a pandemic. That is probably the greatest epidemiological disaster ever known. And so much so <clears throat> that recently it's been argued that, well, now we know that these populations were that big. We know that they were living in cities. They were farming, or well, they were probably modifying tropical forests. That actually, if you remove 90% of that population, you potentially had a grow back of tropical forest to such an extent that it captured more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and contributed to what eventually was to become the Little Ice Age. And there was that big paper by Koch et al. you might have seen in 2019. I think that's probably currently a little bit too simplistic. I think we need to look at the evidence of actual forest regrowth in different areas. But what is not debated is that really 80 to 90% of populations across the neotropics were killed by European diseases. And yes, people could argue that Europeans were not obviously intentionally taking those diseases, but the activities that they performed as we know in pandemics today certainly had an impact. The Spanish were very keen on reducciones, moving indigenous populations into kind of settlement towns that they like to see in Europe. The same in the Philippines, around a town hall, around a church. This is obviously a hotbed for pandemic disease. There's also even worse evidence of, of in some cases, people actually even deliberately infecting people. Um, but this alongside with murder, um, as well as slavery, obviously contributed to the impact of these diseases and, and also contributed to tropical forests. Because interestingly, the environmental historian Shaw Miller has argued that by 1600, 50% of the Spanish population living in the neotropics was living in cities. That's higher than Britain. Britain didn't reach that until the 1700s, 1800s. Now, that's probably not an accurate figure because the census that the Spanish took probably doesn't include the people that didn't want to be taken by the Spanish census, but it still shows you the degree to which the Spanish were obsessed with getting cities and town-like infrastructure across the tropics at this time. They were also obsessed with extracting mineral wealth. The Spanish and the Portuguese are famous for trying to extract silver, gold. You have cities like Potosi and Bolivia. This was bigger than Rome and Madrid at the time. Um, and within 100 years, the Spanish had extracted three times the previous wealth of Europe in silver. Lewis, there's a brilliant paper by Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin that with this great quote that, that actually this Colombian exchange, this interaction then between not just disease, but also the crops and animals that the Spanish and different Europeans moved with them was sort of a swift ongoing radical reorganization of life on earth without geological precedent. They actually argued in that paper that it was the origins of the Anthropocene. Certainly when we look at it, we can see that bringing things like cattle to the Amazon, sheep and goats in the Caribbean, certainly had a massive impact on forests, in introducing invasive species, reducing the ability with which forests could come back. Um, and in the case of donkeys on, on the Canary Islands, actually, there's a, there's a quote that the Spanish had to go out and hunt donkeys. Um, such was the problem that they had become within about 50 years. Oh. Uh, it's not moving. And Mark Maslin just posted this on his Twitter a couple of days ago, you might have seen it. 
Um, this is an illustration by Ben Schmidt of by the 18th and 19th century, these are the trade routes that were sort of regularly being plowed, digitized. And Mark, I think, wrote that this is kind of the reinvigoration of Pangaea at this point, right? That you have the connections between the continents had not been like this since around about that time. Another way that, that sort of impacts were having is obviously the plantation system and the arrival of sugar um, and the wood needed for boiling, for refining, um, and for sugar to be grown had massive impacts on forests. Islands like Madeira were known to be practically deforested within 100 years. And obviously, they also led to, um, in part, demands for labor, racialized labor, um, a focus on black bodies from the African continent um, that were really began to be associated with this plantation system following experiments in Africa, showing that because of early exposure within Africa, they had a resistance to disease. And Europeans increasingly use them. And it, the result is one of the most inhuman uh, things we, we've seen. Um, and um, a real racialization of slavery. Slavery had existed before this point. It existed in Africa. It existed in Europe. It existed in the Mediterranean. But this is the first time that it became a global enterprise and a global enterprise focused on the race of um, the, the individuals being enslaved. Now, but this is not to say that there's not forms of resistance within this, right? We, we can see that, that arguably, it's been argued that actually um, enslaved Black Africans brought rice agriculture to North America. It's been argued that um, within Africa, oil palm was used by enslaved groups to eventually buy their, their freedom. That groups continued to use these crops. These weren't just European, when crops moved, Europeans didn't just implant them. This was caught up in indigenous uh, knowledge, um, on the ground groups that were mixing together foods and cuisines around the world. Um, in terms of maize, maize has often been assumed that when maize arrived in Africa, it was kind of a saving grace because it was such a high calorie rich uh, crop. But actually, um, Amanda Logan in her recent book has shown that actually it was ignored for a long time by local African populations who actually were not in an issue of food security. They had perfectly brilliant agroforestry techniques that have been keeping them surviving through climatic periods and did not need maize. Um, in the Philippines, we can see that what was taken up, actually, you don't get cattle taken up because they already had water buffalo. And the crop that you do get taken up is actually sweet potato because it was most like the taro they'd been using. So indigenous culture economies are shaping how these crops are being taken up in different parts of the world. But the ultimate outcome is sadly that obviously one half of the world benefited from these changes and one half of the world did not benefit in quite the same way. Uh, in the case of islands where the British had, and the French had sort of stripped landscapes just to apply a sort of um, productive landscape based on slavery like Haiti, you have hills and a lack of recovery from deforestation to this day. It was left the poorest nation in the world by the time of independence. And you ultimately have arguments that actually it was um, enslaved labor that drove the industrial revolution of Northwestern Europe, that actually the profits made from the, the transatlantic slave trade um, are what drove investment in new industry um, and also um, potentially the sugar that was produced even fueling the working class. And so how can we use these just to finish up? Sorry, I've, this has been a bit of a, a lot of information thrown at you, but um, bear with me. This is the, this is the, final, the final straight. Um, I just wanted to briefly look at before I finished, well, what does this mean? How can we use this? Clearly there's a long human footprint with tropical forests. There's a long interaction of even us with tropical forests through the impacts of European history on the tropics. But how can we use it? Well, there's an increasing move to look at older records of uh, paleontological records to say, where can we rewild species? In Southeast Asia, there's, a, uh, there's examples of, well, we know that orangutans were actually much more widespread in the past than they are today. Does this mean that we can rewild them in certain places? Um, in other cases, we even have an example in, in the Pacific where extinct tortoises are being replaced by a new tortoise that can have the same seed dispersal function that its predecessors did. So you can't bring back the extinct animals necessarily, but you can perhaps find animals that can play a role in tropical forests within that. Um, you'll be hearing much about this in, in two weeks time, but in terms of the Amazon basin, what impacts have humans had on how tree species are distributed around the Amazon? What impacts have they had on, on forest dynamics um, and things like that? What impacts have they had on soils to this day? Almost every single village you'll see alongside the Amazon basin is located on top of an Amazonian dark earth. That is a legacy of millennia of activity. Um, so there is certainly legacy still there today. And as I mentioned, you know, some NGOs are still trying to push the adoption of maize in Africa as a kind of saving grace of, of kind of good, good, uh, a good way to, to sort of survive um, 
of, of, of calories. But actually, clearly, as we can learn from the past, and, and increasingly, I think um, African farmers are themselves advocating, actually, it's not necessarily as good as agroforestry mixes um, of different crops. Oil palm is the same. We see oil palm pl plantations having a major impact on Southeast Asian forests, but actually where they're combined in sort of more garden systems, um, they can actually um, have a very positive effect on local incomes and not have the same impacts on um, climate change and, and forest destruction as well. And then in terms of cities, I mentioned, you know, obviously in the past, these examples of agrarian, low density agrarian agri um, urbanism. Well, it's interesting that modern sort of city planners are looking towards the development of green spaces, keeping areas of forest, and potentially ultimately trying to incorporate the way we produce food with our urban settings as well. And I think it's interesting that these are directions being followed that have also been proven to be highly effective in the past as well. We can even see that in individual forest landscapes as well. This is an example from the wet tropics of Australia. <coughs> um, and for a long time, they've been celebrated for their Gondwan and heritage. Um, but the kind of human record has been left out a little bit or has been suppressed despite indigenous Aboriginal populations saying, well, actually, we've been managing these landscapes for a long time. And we actually have records that Aboriginal populations were burning patches in the rainforest for settlement. They were burning them. And this is what you end up with. You get these beautiful sclerophyll drier forest pockets and they were clearing paths so that they could move through the forest. They were also clearing the understory. And what this meant was this was actually stopping when a big fire came through, there was not the same kindling in the understory for this forest to take light. What we have today is we have climate change We've had a grow back of actual rainforest and dense rainforest underneath the forest understory. And what this means is that when that vegetation all dries and the forest hits, it can damage the whole forest. And so actually, if we want to preserve these forests for their Gondwanan heritage, we also have to take notice of their human heritage as well that has actually shaped the ecological dynamics there for the last probably eight millennia at least. And then just finishing up with the Anthropocene then, when we think of the Anthropocene and the origins in the tropics then, we clearly have to look a bit further back than the industrial period. There's things like megafauna that I know is increasingly being discussed by ecologists that actually the, if humans are responsible for megafaunal extinctions, they are potentially responsible for clear changes in biodiversity that, that won't likely be recovered for, for millions of years. Um, they're potentially responsible for changes in carbon cycling and seed dispersal as, as a result. Also, if we think of this long record of food production and urbanism, we have to consider that land use in the tropics was actually much more extensive than we've perhaps given credit for. And by mapping that, perhaps we can begin to produce models of how populations had changed forest in the past and what impact that might have had for climate change um, and soils in the area. And this is an increasing area of research that's being developed as well. And finally, this is the, the last slide I promise. Um, the also what comes out of this is that when we're thinking about the Amazon and, and um, Simon and Mark also had a, a conservation article that touched upon this as well. But when we're thinking about the Anthropocene, if we think about its roots in the origins potentially of, you know, if, if transatlantic slave trade drove, drove the industrial revolution, if the Colombian exchange and the diseases that followed and the suppression of indigenous knowledge um, and rights and death ultimately led to things that we can associate with the Anthropocene or even find as the roots of the Anthropocene, then we have to think about how we use that term because we often use it today as kind of a geological, we're looking for a geological spike of the Anthropocene. If we look for a geological spike, we're saying that this is sort of, by implication, a human thing that spreads across the world, right? That all humans are involved, that it affects us all equally. But actually not all humans were involved, at least in this earlier manifestation of it, and not all humans are still involved. And actually when we think about solutions, um, we have to bear that in mind that actually a lot of these issues that are facing tropical forests in terms of deforestation, in terms of invasive species, are a product of this 500 years of colonialism. Um, and Alex Moulton has an excellent uh, paper um, in the States where he talks about how actually there's been three generations of a sort of plantation logic in the Caribbean that stemmed not just from kind of um, the, the application of British, of British application of Chassel slavery there, but extending into subsequent debt to Western European nations following independence. And today sort of modern narratives where these people are praised for their resilience but very little is done to actually help them face natural hazards that are increasing due to climate change that's being generated by fossil fuel burning of which Euro-American societies are by far the greatest producers. So that's just to finish on there. I would just like to thank all these people. Thank you so much again for the invitation, um, for the people at the Max Planck Society and all of the archeologists and many more that this talk, their work is really based on.
And finally, just a bit of a selfless uh, self, uh, promotional push. Uh, a lot of this can be seen in, in an academic book I published in, in 2019. Um, and then in July of this year, there's now it's being followed up by a popular book um, that I hope makes it more accessible because the academic book is very expensive. So thank you again for listening. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, terrific. Uh, uh, fascinating range of material you've managed to squeeze into your, into your talk there. That's great to see. Uh, okay, uh, I'd like to, perhaps if you stop sharing, Patrick. So oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You, in the audience. And uh, I'd like to uh, feel free to switch on your cameras, everyone. It's, it's nice to have a, have a, a visible audience for, for the discussion. And uh, uh, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to ask questions. Pop, just pop into the chat either the question you want to ask or just how you want to ask a question and then I can uh, I can, I can field them to, uh, to over to, to Patrick. Uh, first of all, so just to kick off, there's a question from Kopesh Chawa. Uh, Kopesh, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kalvinda. First of all, thanks, uh, Dr. Roberts, for a wonderful talk. I just had a one question, like, uh, you were talking about uh, people getting into tropical niches like Southeast Asia specifically, but that's not happening for the first time while talking about anatomically modern humans. Homo erectus populations are also there. So what's your take on that? And like walk, while talking about that, how important it is to talk about the size of a population to colonize such areas? Yes, well, I would, I would debate that Homo erectus is living in, in, in forests firstly, because I think it's been seen, it obviously gets into Southeast Asia 1.2 million years ago, so it is in the tropics, that's undeniable. Um, but actually, when we look at the subsistence, there's no evidence for it living in forests. And actually, what we really need is the same kind of isotopic evidence, but obviously, quite rightly, uh, museum curators are hesitant to let that happen. Um, but the one value I have seen shows that it's living in more open areas. Now, it, it, that's not to say it's not using tropical forests at all, and it could be. And, and another point, I think, which I didn't touch on in this talk, because it would have been even, even longer, um, but is the fact that the first hominins emerge in forests in Africa. So actually, even the first sort of, of our hominin clade are living in tropical forests. And even the first members of our genus Homo are still have adaptations to their limbs that suggest they're climbing a lot. So forests remain important throughout human evolution. That's certainly true. Um, I think in terms of hominins moving into tropical forests, they're the only current evidence that I think is strong is with our species. Um, at present. I don't believe that Homo erectus was in there and or, or that it was moving. Uh, and actually, I think it goes extinct in Southeast Asia when the rainforest expands. Um, so I would question that a little bit. Um, in terms of population, I mean, that's a really good point is that um, obviously I think population size has, a, has an impact on, um, well, not, not only if humans are making it into these environments, but also um, the impacts they then have. I think what's interesting are these is this evidence for connections. So in Sri Lanka, where we have, we do have a population living in the rainforest, but it's staying in touch with communities on the coast. And I think something that people have talking about with our species is that we have an incredible ability to build social connections um, and to stay in touch with one another. Um, and that that might in itself be a buffer to climate change, to periods of risk. Um, and so I think perhaps you know, again, it gets back to our species, you know, it was able to specialize in these environments to get into different environments, but it was able to maintain communication so that although certain populations might decline or go extinct as a whole, the species would 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 eventually thrive. Um, I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but Yeah, like, uh, thank you. Like, it's just one more uh, following up with that. Like, do you think is it possible like that these tropical niches can act as ecological backwaters for certain populations at a certain point of time, and they can kind of provide that isolation for the convergent evolution. Yeah, so going back to um, that, that paper I started in Africa, the Bergström et al. Um, so when they're talking about Pan-African evolution, and this is something that, that um, Eleanor Sherry is working on, um, part of that is if you have these different populations contributing to our eventual sort of genetic variability, something has to be keeping them apart before they come together and keep apart, come together, keep apart, come together. And what they think, it, at least in part, it does look like the Central African rainforests are playing an important role there. And you can also see it in the genetics of the hunter-gatherers living in that region today. There are, there are um, some of the hunter-gatherers there have a sort of genetic lineage that seems to suggest some kind of isolation as early as 80, 70,000 years ago. Um, and so these groups that are adapted to the forest, there does seem to be something there. We don't quite know yet, but clearly, I mean, there is something that's causing these pulses of, of, of human populations to, to meet and then be separated, meet and then separate before they all meet and then move out of Africa. So. Um, I think tropical forests almost certainly played a role in that. Um, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't call them backwaters because I think the population living in that living there you know are clearly quite well able to to live there and, and, and enjoy living there perhaps um, but but um, you know I think they are having an impact on how populations are meeting and or, or not. Mm. Okay, uh, Vivek, you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Edwinda. Um, uh, Patrick, uh, th thanks a lot for excellent uh, um, overview of the archaeological significance of tropical forests. Uh, I had uh, a question about uh, the current narrative of green urbanization or uh, making urban spaces much more sustainable. This narrative is more homogeneous, uh, isn't it? Because uh, the narrative which is arising from temperate regions is also being applied to the tropical regions, especially with the given example of uh, Indus Valley, collapse of Indus Valley civilization and uh, more in the tropical arid regions. Uh, uh, there is huge problem with the centralization of human habitation, which results in uh, at least now with the uh, modern uh, technologies huge reliance on, on groundwater resources and it depletes the groundwater resources very highly so uh, I, I think we need uh, heterogeneous models of urbanization uh, uh, we could take example in the sandra postal's book uh, pillars of uh, 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 sand uh, in her book she mentions the uh, ingenuity of uh, 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 southern peninsula indian peninsula uh, uh, Tamil Nadu regions where temple tanks and uh, uh, airy systems, uh, lakes and ponds uh, is an excellent uh, uh, complex adaptive system which has developed for conserving the water resources. So uh, do you think there is need for having a, a heterogeneous models of urbanization or heterogeneous models, as you said, dispersed uh, habitation, which you showed from your archaeological example also? Thank you. Yeah, no, um, great question. I mean, I think I think uh, I highlighted this dispersed example. It obviously doesn't hold for all of the, the cities in the tropics, but I, I highlighted this example because it does appear to provide a certain benefit to populations living in seasonally dry forests that can be prone to, to, to these challenges of water. Um, and I think what is interesting is what we think of when we talk about collapse, right? What is collapsing? Because in the case of the classic Maya, in the case of Gran Greater Angkor, the collapse is in the elite infrastructure. The farmers actually, in the case of the classic Maya, stay there for many years, still doing mill per agriculture. Um, in the case of Greater Angkor, you have an, a movement of the elite um, to the, where the present day capital is. They actually move there to form a more compact city, right? So you have changes in urban types of landscape, but you still have farmers living in and around Greater Angkor um, as well. So I think what I wanted to highlight is, is firstly that this is an interesting dynamic, at least contrasting from our own ideas of what a compact city should be and therefore what the footprint of a city might be on a forest, um, it can be really quite different. Um, but also that I think that, that there are lots of, you're quite right, of course, it's going to be heterogeneous in each case. And I think what's important is, in this case, what we see is that the actual glue holding everything together are these more independent farmers. They're, main, they're the ones maintaining the vast water networks. They're the ones keeping the farming going. Um, and actually, when we talk about collapse in many of these cases, it's not actually a lot of the population that collapses. A lot of them in many cases continue, um, not always, but but in, a, in many cases. And so actually, and that might be a mes message to today's politicians that actually uh, it's the, the people below are actually quite capable of, maybe maybe we're not anymore, but, <laughs> but we used to be quite capable of, um, of moving on and, and doing things. Whereas actually it's, it's sort of the, the sort of bit over, over the top that's in most threat of collapsing. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll put you in a question. So turning to the Amazon, and uh, uh, as you know, that there's quite a debate about the, the extent to which humans occupy the Amazon. You present a, a fairly clear evidence that there was human occupation of something that wasn't recognized many decades ago, and the Amazon could support complex societies. Uh, but how far do you think we can take take that? There, there, there's some arguments that say that the Amazon is essentially a cultural landscape and a, a forest regrowing from mm. extensive human, human habitation. Or others argue that no humans were there, but they were in localized patches, river valley, river buffs, and dry some dry hotspots and, and things. So, what, what's your feeling on mm. that? Yeah, that's a fascinating debate that I'm not sure I want to wade into too much. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously been quite a really intense debate between archaeologists and uh, two, two sort of sides of archaeologists and ecologists, I think, have been debating that for a long time. Um, I think one of the what, what the clear outcome is, we don't really know yet. Um, I think what's interesting is that we now have to deal with the possibility that there were lots of people living there. 
And then I guess there are two ramifications of that. One is, is perhaps the Amazon as we know it today more shaped than humans and what they did in the past than we, we've thought before? Or I guess the other way of looking at it is, well, how did they leave such a small footprint if there were so many people there? So I think there are interesting ramifications, whichever way you look at it. Um, but it's a vast area as well. And I think it's probably different in different areas. So I know a lot of the debate, it's quite interesting that in one area, they find that humans did have an impact on the forest and in another area they didn't. And then they use that to sort of say, well, this is the situation for the whole Amazon. But that obviously doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Um, so I think it's probably gonna be variable and we don't really know yet, but I think we do, it's very clear that we did have large populations there prior to European arrival. And I think the next level of work is I think, as I mentioned, both there and in all these other areas where we have urban populations is now seeing, well, what, what, what was the result um, and has it influenced these landscapes to this day? Bit of a cop out, sorry. <laughs> It's a pretty wise cop out. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Anthony, you have a question? Hi, Patrick. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you. And uh, somewhat tragic and, and hard, painful to listen to some of the, you know, to, to understand the history of colonialism in, in that way of civilizations being, you know, decimated. Um, or, you know, the opposite of decimated, even. Anyway, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build on, on Yadvinder's question a little bit. And um, uh, I, I'm a terrestrial ecosystem modeler, carbon cycle modeler from kind of ecosystem scales to global scales. And, um, you know, traditionally we spin up our models to some kind of equilibrium, either around 1850 or 1700, depending on, you know, how many computer hours you've got or what your question is. And, you know, we assume that at that point, you know, the, the global carbon cycle is in equilibrium and, you know, tropical forests being a key piece of that. And so the, the evidence that you've presented suggests that, you know, the carbon cycle is not in equilibrium in these forests. There's a lot of management or maybe it's in equilibrium, but it's in equilibrium with lots of, you know, shifting um, management practices and whatnot. Mm. So have any comments or ideas or suggestions on how we might go about trying to account for those activities in our in our models mm, that's fascinating i mean this is really area of research that i'm i'm really interested in and it's something we're trying to do in in, in the philippines not not necessarily just the carbon cycle but but with other climate models right what to the degree to which if we try and map archaeologically reconstructed land use what is the effect of that on these uh, systems models um and that's a really interesting question. I think on the one side, it's interesting to talk about equilibrium because I guess one of the tragedies that we'll never know is what would have happened if we, if Europeans had never got to the Neotropics. Because if these estimates are correct and 60.5 million people were living in the Americas at the time of European contact, that's a population that was nearly the size of Europe at the time. And they'd been living in tropical forests or with tropical forests for by that point, at least in most of those areas, 2000 years, at least in terms of, we're talking about big populations of food production and urbanism where they exist. So on the one hand, you could kind of zoom out and say, well, are they in equilibrium? Because they, they might actually, it might be okay, right? What they're doing, it might be having local problems, but as a whole system, you're still maintaining this very large population at the time of, of contact. So that's an interesting question. Um, but I think what is, what is clear is that there have been these attempts to do land use models like KK10, is, is the classic one. And what that does is sort of it estimates a population per capita based on a sort of idea of how much an environmental uh, environment could hold. And I, I think what we're showing is that that is no longer, if you, if you want an accurate model of what humans were doing in the tropics, that's not good enough anymore. Because we know that in different parts of the tropics, it's simply not true. And, and we can see that those models don't work. Um, so what we're trying to do is now build land use model so like a kind of map of, of the footprint humans might have been leaving on on these areas based on um what we know and so as archaeologists and historians like we're trying to sort of drag them to feed into earth systems models which is 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 an interesting exercise of bringing together but i would say to account for those i mean yeah multidisciplinary uh uh interaction right you know asking you know archaeologists is, is this assumption likely um you know, and, and for example, we, we, we've got a paper un, under review at the moment that is looking at this afforestation idea, the idea that following the death of all these people that you had forest regrowth as a kind of un, uniform thing. 
um, which seems unlikely. If you actually look at historically, in some cases, obviously the Spanish are going in and causing deforestation. So you wouldn't expect, why, why would that a, a forest? Um, and so what we're finding is about that is that you do see afforestation in some areas, but you don't in others. And I think that's going to be uh, a story is that is that the, the models are probably going to have to start. I, I know it's hard at the scale you're looking at, right? It's, it's very hard for you to kind of, you know, to, to produce one of these land models is taking a, a project of five years. So and that's for, for the for the Philippines. So, I mean, it's not something that's going to be a, a quick fix, but I guess just bearing it in mind and perhaps simulating different levels of population instead of just these kind of levels that have been assumed based on per capita use of environments maybe um and seeing how that affects things perhaps yeah i don't know if that that was a useful answer but yeah but uh yeah definitely i look forward to working together in the future okay great great uh any more questions from anyone feel free to just uh, pop up and ask your question there's nothing else in the chat box okay If not, uh, I'll pitch in another one. Uh, it's just, uh, just to be provocative again. So this <laughs> idea of the anthropocene, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, many of the arguments you present there argue for a long human history of alteration of the uh, environment. Uh, and uh, for, for others that, that uh, argue for the anthropocene, say that it's, it's a recent phenomenon because it captures the planetary scale change, not, not subtle alterations of the planet, but uh, planet transforming changes. And so. Uh, do you think these arguments you make sort of, uh, fit in to an idea of an early start the Anthropocene, or, or do you think that you know, there's human alteration, but this isn't the Anthropocene? And it is Earl Ellis is in the audience here, so I'm sure he has two opinions on this as well. But, but, but go ahead, Patrick. Yes, no, I think I think I've softened my view of this in the last few years. I think uh, I think before I was I was interested in this early Anthropocene idea. Now I think. It's easier to, uh, you know, in, in, in how the Anthropocene is being defined in terms of ge geological discussions um, as a sort of spike of when you see these planetary impacts. I think obviously, you know, sometime in the 20th century does make sense. And I think there's also a certain value because what I constantly, you know, what we constantly doing this deep time work in the tropics have to do is every time there's a press release, we have to make very clear that just because humans were modifying tropical forests does not mean it's okay to do it now, right? And so there is certainly an inherent value to saying, look, what we're doing now is completely out of scale with what went before. But I think what we do need to do is acknowledge that that process has roots in prehistory. And in some cases, that's going to lead to how the landscapes are here today and maybe even how Earth systems interact today in regional scales. But I think most importantly is this argument that, well, we can't say that we all have to deal with the Anthropocene because the Anthropocene is a product of global wealth discrepancy, of um, racialization, of, of slavery, of um, you know all these different things that that simply you know the places feeling climate change the most today are Pacific Islands, they're Caribbean islands, they're places in and around the Indian Ocean that are seeing climate change and sea level rise that is a product of fossil fuel burning primarily in Europe. Uh, North America and more recently China and you simply can't you know it, it's amazing that we don't think about this more but it's very difficult to turn around and say um, it, that it's not our problem that 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 you know that that um, the Anthropocene is something we all have to deal with together because actually they're facing sea level rise that isn't really something that they've produced right at least proportionally if you look at the fossil fuel burning um, and so I think that's something we very much have to bear in mind when we talk about the Anthropocene because it's a bit of a it can mask, right? As a geological term, it's being intended as being a kind of, you know, objective scientific point of where we can see planetary change. But I think what the archaeological record does show is that we really need to look at the sort of social science, the history, and the archaeology behind where these changes come from um, to produce a more kind of uh, just um, way forward. So I think that's, and I think, so I, you know, I, I think as the concept of the Anthropocene, I think it's easier to leave it as it's being discussed now is probably my increasingly my view. Um, although I think there are Anthropocene processes that begin earlier, put it that way. Um, so, but I, I've definitely changed a little in that process, but I think we do need to look at what went before to understand it and, and deal with it. I don't know what Earl thinks currently, but maybe he's, he might've left. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's violence there. Uh, but, uh, 
and, and the, and oh, are we talking about me? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I was just talking to my wife here. Okay. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, we, were just, uh, we were just reflecting on the Anthropocene and whether uh, uh, the, the merits of thinking of Anthropocene as a recent global transformation uh, as opposed to a deep historical process. And uh, uh, Patrick was indicating it shifted his thinking about this to, to, uh, in, in recent years. Well, I mean, one of the interesting elements to the whole Anthropocene discussion is that it's been framed through the lens recently, at least in recent years, through the Anthropocene Working Group of the International Commission on Stratigraphy, which is required to use the standards of the geologic time scale to define time intervals. And that means that there must be a distinct, discrete global interval. Like you have to say, it starts all at one time, the whole planet basically the equivalent of an asteroid strike. That's how they define their boundaries between time intervals. And for that reason, the, the Anthropocene gets, has to be defined that way in their group, uh, in the group. I'm a member of the group. And it's, it's one reason why I've come to dissent from the group. But there is an alternative that's also not only acceptable, but common practice among geologists and, and, and stratigraphers, which is the event, the geological event definition. And events don't require a iso isochronous definition. They can be diachronous. They can be spatially uh, and time transgressive. So different regions of the world can emerge uh, in this process at different times. So it's more of a process-based definition uh, that can also be officially defined by uh, geologists. So the Anthropocene doesn't need to be an epoch. Um, that's something that we're exploring. Uh, hopefully that'll get accepted for publication soon. But that, I think thinking about it that way makes a lot more sense. And it's the way it originated with the Earth system scientists who are thinking about stages already of the Anthropocene and how it rolled out over time. And then we just need to add the regional patterns, of course, right, where you have different stages of transformation. I, I think that's, that's the way that all the different disciplines can interact with this concept usefully. The idea that it's, you know, instantaneous, some moment in 1950, the Anthropocene begins and before that's the Holocene, is not a useful definition. Great, thanks, Al. And, and I loved your talk, just by the way. Okay. I, 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 was, I was just saying, actually to my wife, like, this guy's got it. This guy totally gets it. <laughs> so thanks. awesome work. Thank you, Al. Great, thanks. Uh, Okay, any, any other questions, any final questions? Okay, I can't see anything coming in. So if not, uh, I encourage you to uh, join me, unmute your microphones and join me in a round of applause. It's nice to hear real, real loud clapping. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I will we'll post this uh, talk onto YouTube and I'll, I'll post it probably in the next few hours and feel free to share it with your colleagues and students and others who, who couldn't join live. We've made a nice library of these talks online uh, to, to, to make available for people around the world to, to, to listen in and discuss. So thank you. I hope to see you, uh, some of you, in the next few weeks and the rest of the seminars that, that we have coming up. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Thank you all for listening. Have a good evening.